Hello, my name is Roger Watson and welcome to this session on dealing with publication misconduct. I'm the Professor of Nursing at the University of Hull and I'm also the Editor-in-Chief of Nurse Education in Practice. Publication misconduct, of course, comes under the general umbrella of research misconduct. And research misconduct can be very wide indeed, uh, dealing with everything from the funding aspects through the ethical aspects and through to the actual conduct and publication of the research. So under the more general aspects of research misconduct, there are more specific aspects. And then one of these specific aspects is uh, publication misconduct. And that will be the uh, subject of this particular session. It's very difficult to disentangle publication misconduct from research misconduct. And it's a little bit artificial to look at them separately. However, that's precisely what I'm going to do here. I'm going to focus on publication misconduct. So why do we need publication ethics? Well, um, publication ethics exist because, according to Biomed Central, one of the major uh, open access online publishers in medical research, ethical standards for publication exist to ensure high quality scientific publications, public trust and scientific findings, and that people receive credit for their ideas. So publication ethics is not only about issues of copying, making up results and so forth. It can also be to do with authorship. And as an editor in chief, I can assure you that one of the most common things that we have to deal with are uh, authorship issues. And I like this quote from Aldo Leopold. It's a, it's a partial quote, but ethical behavior is doing the right thing when no one else is watching. So publication ethics is not about policing. It's about trying to inculcate good standards into people and to make them uh, autonomous in their academic publishing and for them to understand fully um, what it means to be uh, an ethical publisher and to, and, and to publish uh, ethically. And of course, it doesn't just apply to, to authors, it applies to editors, publishers and to reviewers of, of manuscripts. So I like that phrase and I think that's really what we're aiming to do when we consider uh, publication ethics. However, it doesn't always work out like that and some people do the wrong thing and they have to be investigated and managed and not to put too fine a point on it, they have to be dealt with in some way and that's really the specific subject material of this session. So some specific ethical issues in publication and I think this covers uh, all of the potential issues. There are six of them. The first is duplication. The next is plagiarism. Next is falsification and fabrication. Authorship issues and finally conflicts of interest. Now I'm not going to go into these in any detail here. I just wanted to make sure that you saw that list. If you want to know more about these you can check out my YouTube presentation publication ethics at the link below. So the job for anyone dealing with um, publication ethics and where there are reports of something having gone wrong are to decide the, uh, the specific nature of the uh, ethical transgression and the extent to which it was either deliberate or accidental. So was it intentional or non-intentional? Was it a mistake or was it actually fraud? Was it an attempt to, um, to uh, misrepresent? Uh, was it an attempt to uh, use someone else's work? Or was it an attempt to pass off work that was of a poor standard as being work of a higher standard? Uh, there are no end really to the ways in which these kinds of frauds can be committed. Now, we don't as editors work alone on this. Since late uh, 
and since the late 90s, I think uh, 1997 specifically, the Committee on Publication Ethics was established. It's uh, known by the acronym COPE. This was initially established in medicine by the then editor of the BMJ, Richard Smith, and the then editor of The Lancet, the predecessor to the current one, Richard Horton. And this was set up because of growing concerns about poor ethical practices in, uh, in, in medical publications, specifically uh, duplication and, and plagiarism, which of course can have very serious uh, consequences for the ultimate consumers of medical research who are patients. Now, COPE is not a governing body and signing up to COPE on behalf of publishers is voluntary. All the major publishers, for example, Wiley, Elsevier, Springer, Sage, Nature, the BMJ, and of course the Lancet, which is part of Elsevier, all the major publishers are signed up to COPE. And that gives them the right to advertise that in their author guidance and also to have a COPE number to show that they are registered with COPE. So it's quite easy uh, uh, for these journals to say how they deal with uh, ethical matters on the journal and what standards they adhere to, because they just refer people to the COPE guidance and to the COPE website, which we're going to take a look at in a minute. In years gone by, and I've been in academic publishing for over 30 years, most things were governed by what might have then been called gentlemen's agreements. Now, we wouldn't use that phrase now. Uh, one, because it's uh, gender specific, and two, because to use another uh, gender specific term, it conjures up images of, a, of an old boys network where things are not really that strict. There are grey areas where things can be interpreted in people's favour and, and such like. But COPE was set up to try and um, overcome some of these problems. Now, it was specifically initially about medical publications spread across the whole of health, nearly the whole of what I call wet lab science, social sciences and so forth. So COPE really governs ethical standards across a wide range of, uh, of subjects now. Not all publishers are signed up to COPE uh, and I have had issues with some publishers where I've noticed unethical practices and they've simply replied, we are not, uh, we are not signatories to COPE. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that what they were doing was ethically acceptable, but you don't have any recourse to them. However, if someone has signed up to COPE, they can be reported to COPE, and of course COPE can take away their accreditation if they are not uh, obeying the rules, as it were. However, as I say, COPE is not a governing body, it's an advisory body. It doesn't sit in judgment. The judgments about uh, ethical malpractice are uh, specifically in the remit of the editors-in-chief and the publishers of the journals where these issues arise. Now this is rather long-winded and it comes from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, COPE educates and supports editors, publishers and those involved in publication ethics with the aim of moving the culture of publishing towards one where ethical practices become the norm, part of the publishing culture. COPE's approach is firmly in the direction of influencing through education resources and support of COPE members alongside the fostering of professional debate in the wider community. It can also provide a forum for its members to discuss individual cases and it meets four times a year in the UK and North America. And COPE publishes a monthly newsletter and organises annual seminars. COPE has created an audit tool for members to measure compliance with its core practices and guidance in the form of flowcharts, discussion documents, guidelines and e-learning modules. So what COPE offers is very wide and what I suggest we do now is to take a look at the COPE website. OK, let's take a look at the COPE webpage. Easy to find just by typing COPE into Google. That usually brings it up near the top. And this is the landing page. As usual, you have to accept some cookies. Tells you what it's about. Uh, promoting integrity in scholarly research and its publications. And it's got a lot of links below and some useful material there that you can take a look at. 
but uh, everything's also available from the drop down menus at the top. Here you can find out about COPE, about the organisation and what it does. They've also got core practices. Uh, we won't look at these today, but these used to be called codes of practice. These are core practices to govern how publishers, editors, authors and reviewers uh, should, should behave, including what we're going to look at next, which is um, handling uh, cases where publication ethics have been, uh, have been contravened. You can find members and, if, and you can also become a member, um, but that you have to be the editor of a journal to become a member or your publisher has to uh, pay to, uh, to, to have you become a member. Uh, there are lots of resources here. There's a, a COPE forum and uh, on the forum you'll find uh, various cases that are available to look at and you can register for the COPE forums that are coming up and you can attend them uh, as webinars or you'll be sent a link to see them later once they've been recorded. And there's also e-learning available and you can learn about different aspects of publication ethics. This is probably not relevant to authors, but it's very relevant to editors and publishers so that there's a common understanding of, of these concepts. Under the guidance, there's a, a, a general um, link to finding guidance. There's also various guidelines and there are cases here that you can look at. But I wonder what, what I want to look at specifically here are the uh, flowcharts. And the flowcharts are there to guide editors in how to handle uh, specific cases of mis or suspected uh, misconduct. And these can be downloaded as uh, PDFs or you can look at them online and I'll find the link to, as you can see, there are many different ways in which you can contravene uh, publication ethics and it isn't just, uh, isn't just authors who can do this, editors and publishers can also be accused. But let's look at the most um, serious uh, kind of case and that would be plagiarism in a submitted manuscript. So we'll look at the web version. So here it uh, tells you that uh, a reviewer informs an editor about suspected plagiarism. For example, although uh, it can often come in uh, by, by other ways, authors can also find uh, examples of plagiarism and report them to you. One of the ways that plagiarism and also uh, duplication of articles is often detected is by people doing uh, systematic reviews. So uh, continue. So. Thank the reviewer and say that you plan to investigate. So that's the first step that the editor has to take. And you've got to get uh, evidence from them, of course. And if they don't provide it, you cannot proceed. So they have to be very specific about what the plagiarism is, the extent of it, and, and where it is. Then, uh, once you've, you've checked that, uh, you may come to the conclusion that there's a clear case of plagiarism. In other words, large portions of an article have been used without um, without uh, altering them and without attribution. Minor copying, it may be redundancy, it may be the author's own work, or that may not be a problem. So we'll, we'll assume that, this, uh, that, the, that the editor uh, suspects the worst and that it's a clear case of plagiarism. So we'll click on that to see what the possible courses of action are. So as soon as possible, you have to contact the corresponding author in writing and you've got to uh, show them uh, their authorship statement, which they should have signed or attested to at some point in the process to say that the uh, article was being uniquely submitted to that journal and it wasn't copied from any other sources. And there are cases here that you can look at that, that might be helpful. So once you've contacted the author, then you have to wait. Now there are two scenarios here. The author responds and if the author responds then you can decide that the explanation is not satisfactory uh, and that they, but th that they have uh, ad admitted guilt uh, or that they have ad admitted guilt or they've given a satisfactory explanation. Um, if it's unsatisfactory or they admit guilt then you have to write to the author uh, possibly rejecting the sub submission or requesting revision or explaining their position 
and uh, what they should do in future. And you can also, um, if they're serial offenders, which some people are, you can uh, prevent them from submitting to the journal in future. However, uh, let's go back up again and you get no response. The next step is that you should try to contact all of the authors and this all has to be documented. You have to uh, demonstrate that you've been able to do all this before you take the next step. Continue, uh, the authors respond, then you can act in the same way as above, either their explanation is satisfactory or unsatisfactory and you can act accordingly. If there's no response, then there is a case that you can look at, for example, but continue. Then the ultimate step would be to contact the author's institution and uh, pass the concern over to them to deal with. And of course, you can ask them for a response to that. They are not necessarily obliged to give it to you. And that can result in someone's uh, being disciplined or even being dismissed, as I've seen happening in some cases. And sometimes the uh, institutions don't get back and you should contact them uh, every three to six months. So you should keep a note as an editor in your diary to, to get back to them, uh, maybe for a year or so. If there's no resolution, then you can contact other authorities, for example, the Office for Research Integrity in the US or the General Medical Council in the UK, if it happens to be a medic. There are various ways in which you can uh, approach this. And there, there it ends. Essentially, you, you've done uh, everything that you'd be expected to do to handle this case. And uh, the author really can't fail to know that you're onto them. And I have to say, in my experience, most authors uh, get back to you and they do eventually own up. And the usual course of action, if it's very serious, is to retract the paper. And this means that the paper remains in the public domain. Uh, papers rarely, if ever, disappear from the public domain, but they will have a watermark through it or a, a note online alongside it saying that the paper has been retracted. Another site which I think would be useful for you to take a look at is Retraction Watch. Now, Retraction Watch is not a governing body either. It's a voluntary organisation funded by a subscription which exists to essentially report on the extent of retraction within uh, academic publishing, particularly in, in, in the harder sciences, and who's doing it uh, specifically and what they've done. So I also suggest that we take a very quick look at the Retraction Watch webpage. I mentioned Retraction Watch and we'll take a quick look at their website. This is a useful website to keep an eye on and you can sign up for daily email alerts which alert you to the main papers for that day. Not all retractions but other issues as well but it does keep a tally of all retracted papers and uh, other cases so it's, it's very interesting to see exactly what other people get up to. And this uh, website does uh, name and, and shame people. But it also covers issues, for example, who owns your th thesis data. Uh, we do say is one university, and uh, that can often take you to another link. Uh, in this case, it's uh, taking you just to the link for that particular article. Um, but there are other links take you to other articles that are on the website uh, about these issues. Um, it will give you as much information as possible about the actual uh, about the actual paper and the people involved. Down the left hand side uh, you can find out how to support Retraction Watch. That means uh, financially they take donations. It's, a, it's not, a, not a funded organisation. tells you a little bit about the Retraction Watch staff and it tells you the latest sort of headlines. So for example uh, there are, there's been a great deal of concern uh, this is being recorded just, just as the pandemic, we hope, is coming to an end. There's been a great deal of concern about uh, poor quality amongst coronavirus papers. So there's a list here of all the papers that have been definitely retracted. Uh, and it also shows the papers that are under uh, investigation. And 
then you can find uh, other other links here and there's a database as well which you can find online and you can actually search it for papers you can search it for authors and you can search it for subjects to see where retractions are taking place so well worth having a look at retraction watch well worth signing up to the daily emails So I hope you found that, that useful. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, that's my email address. If you want to contact me, you can check out my own publication record at ORCID. You can follow me on Twitter if you've really got nothing else to do. And if you happen to be on WeChat, likewise, you can keep in contact with me that way. So once again, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>